Okay. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm sorry we're starting a little bit late, quite a bit late now that I'm looking at the clock. I sincerely apologize. Uh, could not be helped. But uh, you're, uh, you're in for a great treat. There's, uh, there's a lot to say on this Parsha. Uh, we're going to uh, give a quick, quick summary, and then we'll get right into it. The... Um, uh, I understand if, uh, for whatever reason, uh, and everybody hears me, right? Okay. Yes. Um, if, if for whatever reason you need to leave early, I understand we're starting a little bit late. That's fine. Um, you can uh, always go back to uh, the YouTube channel and uh, watch the video there for whatever parts you missed uh, or whatever parts you want to review. That's fine. Um, we have a variety of commentaries this, uh, I see uh, this evening. We're going to have Hasidic commentary. We're going to have Sephardic commentary. We're going to go uh, to Rashi and the Gurari and the Maral, the Malbim. A lot of good stuff today. Lots of exciting stuff. Um, Nechama Leibowitz is going to pop in today. Uh, it's all good. So uh, to make uh, a long story short, uh, this week's Parsha is called Emor. It starts off dealing with laws specific to Kohanim, uh, different things that Kohanim uh, have to do in order to stay pure and different from other Jewish people. We know Kohanim, there are certain people they're not supposed to marry. Also, there's uh, the details about how, um, how Kohanim should look in order to serve uh, in the temple and in the Beit HaMikdash. And we're, uh, if you want to see more about that, there's a video I put out. Uh, this week's Parsha uh, video is on that. Um, and then all of a sudden there's a switch. There's a shift. Uh, without much uh, of a kind of almost like a non sequitur, not much um, in terms of uh, not much in terms of uh, transition. It goes right into the holidays and the the different korbanot, the different sacrifices that were brought in the holidays. We read about this during the holiday season, Pesach, Shavuot, uh, not Shavuot, Sukkot. Uh, we read about this, so. Um, and I, and, uh, and and so we'll uh, we'll get some of that as well. There's going to be some commentary on that as well. But uh, a lot of that commentary you should be familiar with from uh, the holiday Divrei Torah that we give. Okay, so that's uh, that's that. And then we're going to now shift to with the transition. We're going to shift to uh, the deep dive into the parsha, and it looks a little something like this. This is the parsha sheet that I sent out. It is available. Uh, if you're watching this on the on uh, our YouTube, uh, then uh, in the comments and the in the description of the video, we have the link to the source sheet. Anyway, so let's start with the beginning. Uh, there's there are three psukim we're going to look at all at once, and we're going to skip a little bit. So we're going to do chapter 21 verses one, two, and six. So those of you who know math very well, you know we're skipping three, four, and five. <laughs> and that's not because we don't like those psukim, but because we're trying to make a point about verse 6, as we're about to see. The Pasuk says, Vayom Hashem Moshe. Uh, Hashem spoke to Moshe, Emor, that's where the partial name comes from, Emor, speak, El HaKohanim, speak to the Kohanim, B'nai Aaron, the sons of Aaron, Ve'amartalehem, and say to them, La nefesh lo yitama ba'amav, do not become, uh, tame, do not become impure to any soul of your people and they're going to they're going to be some exceptions of course but uh but basically the kohanim are not supposed to go as we know to funerals to cemeteries they're not supposed to become tame mate for just anybody there are specific situations where they should be could be but definitely not uh piecemeal as we do With the exceptions of these exceptions, the relatives who are closest to them, that, by the way, implies the wife. And, and so a coin can go to the funeral of his wife, take care of uh, the, the needs of his uh, deceased wife, etc. And also his mother, his father, his son, his daughter, and his brother, obviously his sister is included. We'll get to that. 
uh, or maybe not today. Uh, and then we skip to verse six, which says, Kadoshim uh, you should be uh, holy to your God. And do not profane Hashem's name. Those are two opposites, by the way. Be holy to Hashem in Hashem's name and don't be machal al Hashem. Those are two extremes. There's no, there doesn't seem to be middle ground there. Ki et ishe Hashem lechem elokehem heim makrivim iyu kodesh. Because that's what they do. Their, their job is to be holy to Hashem because they serve Hashem. They bring the sacrifices. They are supposed to be somehow a, a step above everybody else and that's why somehow that's a, that's why the, the, logically they shouldn't go to funerals uh, you're probably wondering and you should be uh why is uh going to funerals somehow some in some way a uh how do you say a hilal hashem a somehow a diminution of hashem's greatness what, what how, how does that play into it at all so the uh, to begin to find an answer, and we looked at some answers last year. I believe we looked at Rav Hirsch. Uh, this year we're going to look at the pre -tzadik. We have not quoted. I don't think we've ever quoted the pre -tzadik in this class. Seven. Sorry. Uh, uh, let's make sure everybody's muted. Uh, let's see if I can do that myself real quick. Uh, yeah, I can meet some people. Uh, okay, great. All right, just in case. All right, you can obviously unmute if you have any questions. I encourage questions. Um, but uh, we're looking at, right now at the pre tzaddik of Lublin, famous uh, the Rav Tzadik a Cohen, uh, who was has interesting, fascinating life. Uh, we don't really have that much time right now for biography, but he uh, was not always Hasidic, and he became Hasidic over time and then became a rabbi. So uh, kind of an interesting story. He was very, very prolific, wrote lots of books, lots of interesting books. He has an, a fascinating book he wrote, uh, basically journaling his dreams that he had for over 40 years. So that's uh, quite, uh, quite an impressive thing, some commentary, etc. All right, so he begins by, uh, by quoting these psukim that we just did. And then he, uh, he quotes a Midrash. The Midrash tells us in Tanakhuma, um, that's what we have here. Um, it says, um, it compares this, uh, this, this idea of not to uh, go to funerals, it compares this, Mashallah Mahadavar Dome, we're over here on the top now, Mashallah Mahadavar Dome, what, what is this comparable to? What, what is a, an allegory that'll help us understand this? Latevach Shaya Nichnas Hamelech. A baker, the king's baker, he goes in and out of the, of the palace, Amar HaMelech, so he says to him one time, Goes around here, I'm going to make a gazer. The king says to him, I'm making a decree. I'm making a law specific to you, you baker, king's baker and all. Alecha shalot tira et hamed kol yamecha. That you should never see a dead body your whole life. <laughs> this is the baker. What does he have to do with dead bodies? Why? You go in and out of my palace and you see my face. And then you see the dead face. Shalot tatame et a party in Shali. Don't I don't want the same eyes that gaze upon me to also have to gaze upon disgusting things, to gaze upon the dead. You know, it's it does it does it doesn't befit my glory, my kingship for you to go and do that. So that's the uh the pre tzaddik quotes this text from the Midrash. Right, it says it says this is, there's a doma uh, tevach, all right, um, etc. Lefi tamze lo hayat zarich liyot isur tumat hakohanim rak bezman shebet hamigdash kayam v'nichnesim lavoda vodazara 
uh, so you would think that okay let's let's see if if that's true that the Kohen should not see the face of a dead person because he's also involved with seeing Hashem whatever that means he goes to the base of Migdash right he goes to the base of Migdash so he's involved in the sanctuary of Hashem so he shouldn't also be involved with the dead so therefore, you might assume, okay, so now that there isn't a Beit HaMikdash, unfortunately, due to our sins, etc., we, we don't right now have a Beit HaMikdash, so maybe, maybe it's okay now, maybe Kohanim can go to funerals and be involved in Hebrew Kedisha, etc. But that's not the case. That's not the halacha. So what, so what, is, what is going on? What's, what does any of this have to do with each other? Aaron, is famous for several things. One of the things he's famous for is what's called Yirat, Shema, Yirat Hashem, or Yirat Shemaim. Sorry. All right. So, um, So he's famous for a few things, but one of the things uh, Aaron Akon is famous for is you at Shemaim. He had an awe of Hashem. Right? Um, and what does that mean? That means not, not only when he was in a Beit Hamikdash or in the Mishkan did he feel Hashem's presence. Wherever he went, whatever he did, there's a godliness in all of his actions. He felt Hashem's presence everywhere, as we all should, because as we sang when we were children, Hashem is here, Hashem is there. Hey, he's, Hashem is literally everywhere. Everywhere you let him in, that's where Hashem is. And so therefore, there should be no problem for any, all of us to feel Hashem's presence everywhere. So why don't we? Well, we don't because we are, we're distracted and we have uh, some some bad ideas sometimes in our head or whatever, and we don't always feel the godliness that is all around us. And if we did, by the way, we'd probably go crazy anyway. It's just, it would be too much, right? But Cohen, a coin is supposed to have that. And he's supposed to sort of get that sort of um, genetically from Aaron. Aaron had that. So... So he writes that al yede hayira shetiare aron zachel leze sheyeh noheg levanav and uvnei vanav leolam. So his son, his children, and his grandchildren forever, all uh, genetically at least, have this ability to have a strong feeling of godliness wherever they go. This year Shemayim. He quotes the Zohar. It says uh, that, uh, that similarly, similarly, Mekachet uh, Torah da Shabbat the Male Shabbat the Iha Yira the Shari Ba Yira the Hainu the Midat Malchut Knesset Yisrael Keneged Shem Al of Dalich Mura Al Yira. So he goes on to say the from the Zohar that every Shabbat is a chance for us to become. More, Yira, more of uh, Yire, Yiraim, Yiraim, right? More, more uh, God-fearing people. We have that ability in Shabbat. Why? Because we uh, we sort of also become a Kohen, and we're allowed to enter. Like the Beit Hamikdash is the holy place. Shabbat is a holy time. There's holiness that, and the Rav Tzadok Kohen writes this in many places. He writes about how kedusha is something that goes through different, um, goes through different um, dimensions. There's a dimension of, of of time, and the holiest time is Shabbat. There's a dimension of place, and the holiest place is the Beit Hamikdash. And there's a kedusha. There's a holiness uh, dimension of of people, and the greatest of people is the holiest of people is a kohen. So that's why on the holiest of days, Yom Kippur, 
the holiest of people, that's the Kohen Gadol, goes into the holiest of place, the Beit Hamikdash, on the holy in the holiest of time, which is Shabbat, which is why which is why Yom Kippur is called Shabbat Shabbaton. I'm not going to get into much more detail than that regarding this, but the point is that this Yerat Shemayim that the coin has, this Yerat Shemayim is something that is all prevailing. In other words, it's it's everywhere he goes, and so therefore, whatever he does, whatever wherever he goes. He's supposed to, it's supposed to be an inspiring thing. And death is not supposed to be doing that. That's not the purpose of death. Death isn't supposed to inspire uh, life, right? So that, and that's, that's what a coin is. So therefore, to keep these things separate and not to intermingle the two, the Hashem made a gazera, just like the king in this story made a gazera, that because you serve me, now, you coin because you have this year Shemayim and you're supposed to feel my presence everywhere you go. I don't want you involved in seeing any death. It would diminish my my holiness if you did that. At least in your perspective. All right, and there's more uh, there's more to say about that if you if you have the chance. It's definitely worthwhile to look at that source. I have the entire source there for you in the source sheet. Uh, now we're going to skip a whole three psukim to 21, chapter 21, verse 9. Uvat, and this is a very, very controversial thing, and it's worth discussing because we are uh, 21st century people. Uh, we're able to discuss things uh, like adults, hopefully. And, uh, and therefore, uh, even controversial things can be discussed. I would say must be discussed. And this is the opportunity to do it because we are learning the Torah. And it's in the Torah. It says, "Vat ish kohen ki techel is not et aviha. He mechalelat beish tesare. The daughter of a coin, bat ish kohen, ki techel is not. She defiles herself through znot, through znus, through znut. In other words, through um, inappropriate sexual behavior." So um, she's actually, it says, at she's defiling her father. It doesn't say she's Michalelet Hashem. She's Michalelet Aviv, Aviha, her father. And so therefore she gets a very, very stern punishment. So stern, in fact, it's discussed in the Talmud. It's, uh, it's, it's an unusually very strict punishment. She's killed by fire. She's burned to death. Now, burning to death, uh, you've probably seen in movies where they tie somebody up, they light like a barbecue underneath them, et cetera, et cetera. That's not how uh, the Jewish court would burn somebody. There was a whole method. I'm not sure you want to go into the details. But uh, the point was to, um, to kill the person by fire. It has to be directly through the fire, for the heat of the fire, that the person died. Very, very unusual punishment. Uh, there's maybe three or four, maybe five different things I can think of that you can uh, get that punishment for. And this is one of them. That's a daughter of a coin uh, having a, uh, in, a, an illegal relationship. Let's say she has a relationship with, uh, with, uh, with uh, she's married and she has an affair or she has a relationship with, um, somebody she shouldn't have a relationship with, etc. So she's killed by fire. So it's very unusual, and it's definitely worth uh, discussing why that happens, of all things. So to get an answer, we're going to turn to Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky in the Emet Liakov. So he writes, i just give you a, a little a brief, uh, uh, no, forget about it. I was going to give you an introduction. You don't need an introduction. Hine shalhi mesechet sukkah. It says in mesechet sukkah, page 96b, if you want to look it up. But Ma said Miriam bat bilga. There's a lady by the name of Miriam bat bilga. Shamira data haita mib atet ayin gimel. Uh, Hamizbeach, Lokos, Lokos, Ad, uh, Matai, Ata, 
Machla Mamona Shal Yisrael, etc. So she um, she basically she started praying at the Mizbeach to this uh, Greek god named Locus. It says in the Gemara that because of this, Kansinan Bimishmarto Shal Bilga Shal Olam Cholaket Bidarum. So Bilga was a a uh, a mishmar. In other words, it was one of the families of Kohanim, and they had a uh, a set time when they were supposed to do their work in the Beit Hamikdash. And because of the actions of this this daughter of theirs, that she was sort of focused, that she was basically praying to avoid a zara. So because of that, they lost the mishmar. They were kicked out of the uh, out of the uh, out of the routine. They're kicked out of the uh, the cycle. Umiksha, the Gemara. The Gemara asks, Mishum Barte, Kenisnan Lay the day. What 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 is what does that have to do with it? Why why would why would you punish an entire family because of the actions of this girl? Amar Bai, Inka, Mira, and Inshi Shota, uh the Nuka Vishuka, Ola Avha, Ola Le Ame. So even a crazy person only says things they hear from their mother or their father. Here's Rashi, and Rashi explains there in the Gemara. What does that mean? Zelashona, and this is his language. Ma shehatino medaber bishuk, that which a child says in the market, in other words, that which a child says publicly, me'avivo mi'imo shama, he heard it from his mother or from his father. So now we, now we see things a little bit clearly. Nira, we see now this rule we see is specifically about a daughter. Why? Until quite recently, until uh, Sarah Shanira, who is one of the options for the May 30th uh, discussion of great women in the Torah world. So until she started the Beit Yaakov movement, Women were educated primarily at home. That's the Iker Chinuch Habat He Babayit. It's a Ha'av or Ha'em from the mother of the father. Masha'eno Kain Beven, as opposed to a son, right? A son is out. He has to go to the yeshiva. Or this is back in the day. You know, he had to go out to the yeshiva. He might have seen things. He might have heard things. He might have other friends who are telling him other things. He's got other influences. You know, in sociology, they talk about different uh, groups that influence a person. Right? They're, they're called sociological influences. And amongst them are parents and peers and c- the culture around them. A girl back until 100 years ago or so, maybe a little more, a girl only had what was at home. Where else was she supposed to learn things? There was no school for girls. So in that situation, in that situation, Lachain, Matinu, Benara, Shema Ursa, Shisoklin, Ota, Petach, Bait, Aviha. A girl is learning from the house of her father. And especially a girl who is the daughter of a Kohen. And she finds, we find that she's uh, involved in uh, immoral behavior. Where did she learn it from? It's from her father, from her family. That's the, that house is what she's actually being Michalelet. She's degrading that. That's the, we see that's the product of the Chinuch she learned from her father's house. And we don't see the same thing regarding a son. Obviously, a son is, uh, has other possible influences, some of them negative. The father can't be in control of everything the son learns. The mother can't be in control of everything the son learns. The mother and the father back then were in complete control of what their daughter learned. So if she was going to go out in the shuk 
and say things that were inappropriate, or if she was going to go and be mazana herself, obviously she learned it from somewhere. There's something wrong with the behavior in the house. That's what she learned, and that's what she's going out to uh, to now uh, profane her family name. This is not to say that the same is true today. We live in a very, very different world, and we have all kinds of influences. You don't need to leave your house to be influenced anymore by something that doesn't belong in your house. People who 20, 30 years ago were careful not to have a TV in their house, were not so careful not to have a computer. They need a computer for this, for that. And then there's the internet, and then there's Netflix, and then there's YouTube, and you get all kinds of things for better or for worse, mostly for worse. Uh, you have to really uh, sort of filter out what you don't want just to get something good out of uh, the information that's available. So there's, uh, but, but, but certainly back then, uh, parents were much more uh, in control of what their children learned. And it makes a lot more sense that a child, when they're punished, is actually an embarrassment to her parents. It's, it has a lot to say about their upbringing that she went this way because there's really no other influences that could have given her such, uh, such kinds of ideas. <coughs> it's important to note, <coughs> it's important to note that if you talk to somebody about this, um, I mean, like somebody outside this class, and you bring this up, a possible response that they'll give you is, I didn't learn this from my parents. I learned this from myself. I felt this way myself. Uh, I'm giving this person a voice. Uh, the, the, the truth is, yes, you had a Yetzirah within yourself that wanted to do bad things. But the fact that you didn't learn any methods to control that Yetzirah, that's a fault of your parents. Your parents' main responsibility is to teach you methods to fight that Yetzahara. There could be so many different angles of the Yetzahara that your parents can't get at everything. So that happens. Unfortunately, it happens much, much more often nowadays now that all of these um, negative influences are available to children everywhere. All right, we're going to skip now to the next chapter. That was a lot on chapter 21. We're skipping to chapter 22. Verse 15, sorry, 14, 15, and 16. Okay. Bish. All right. Amen. Ki yochal kodesh bishkaga. Somebody ate holy stuff by accident. Now, holy stuff, where kodesh, uh, specifically trume and such, is supposed to be the food of the kohen. If it's being eaten by somebody other than a Kohen, it's a sin. But, says this Pasuk, But this person can give the Kohen back the value of that food he ate plus a fifth. But then... But the priest is not supposed to let any Jew profane the sacred donations that they set aside. In other words, they're not supposed to just let them do it and then pay them back and give them a fifth. That's not the that's not the idea. Uh, otherwise, if he, uh, if the coin does this, and the coin lets somebody do this on purpose, so they're going to get a, uh, there's going to be some sort of guilt and a penalty for eating these kinds of things because it's Hashem who makes these things holy. It's not up to us whether it be holy or not. Ask the Orachayim. Somebody just ate truma. 
and they're going to undo this? How can you undo that? You know, um, somebody brings home uh, a special dessert for themselves, right? A brings home a special dessert. B waits for A to go to sleep and then eats that dessert him or herself. Can you undo that? Can you fix it somehow? If it's a special dessert, not uh, not sold at your local 7-Eleven, it's already late at night, it's impossible to get. The next morning, the A is going to want their dessert and B's already eaten it. So what are you going to do? There's no fixing it. Let's turn to the Orachayim to see what he says about this, why this is different. We're going to look at two Orachayim, one on Pasuk Yud Gimel and one on Pasuk uh, Tet Zion. So 14 and 16. He starts by quoting the rabbis. Rabbatein Zal. Nech leku beperek shishi betrumot. So they have an argument in the Mishnah in Trumot in chapter 6. Rabbi Eliezer Omer, Rabbi Eliezer says, Kisha Ruli Yod Kodesh. The non coin is supposed to give the coin something that's fit to be holy. Truma, whether it be grain, oil, wine. Even if he consumed, even if he ate another kind of food. Rabbi Akiva Omer HaKodesh Achal, he has to give the Kodesh that he ate. There's no, there's no halfsies. There's no, uh, there's no uh, this for that. Ad Khan, that's where the quote of the Mishnah ends. Vulai, and it could be. It's possible, could be, that this pasuk is meant to say that through this giving, in other words, of this food that's like uh, truma, not specifically the same food, but any kind of food that could have been truma, the Torah considers it, the verse considers it as if he is actually giving the truma itself. And as if he never ate the Kodesh. He never ate the truma. Is that amazing? It could be that he... Sorry. It could be that just by doing this thing, he erased what he did. It's gone. It's like it never happened. He never ate the truma by giving what he should, which, what he should give, and adding the fifth. It's that's it. He's done. It's like it never happened to begin with. He continues to comment on the next verse, verse sixteen. It says, the verse says, and they will cause themselves, in other words, they will make themselves uh, bear, become guilty of, or worthy of the guilt offering. Perush, the explanation of this, is Kishelo Yifru Karen Vechomesh. This is when the non Kohen who ate the truma did not pay the fifth. Yagdilu Geder Ashema Asu Beshogeg, the Kare Mezid Shahu Avon. He turned the whole level of the sin from something that, was, that happened by accident. Right? It was Bishogeg. And now it's become amazing because they're not paying it back. Because they have the power, they have the ability to fix it and they don't. 
that's why the verse says, "Vihisiu." They deserve. They they've gotten. They they've put the guilt punishment upon themselves. Perush yinasu from the word nasa, which means to raise. They raised it up. Vihisiu. They raised it up to a guilt offering. It was a chatat. It was something they could fix. And now they brought it up. Now they made it so much greater than it was. They made a mountain out of a molehill. Whenever it says the word avon, which is a sin, uh, it started out as an ashma in this case. It started out as a guilt, right? He deserved the guilt offering, and now it's an avon. It's a, it's a, it's a necessary. It's a, it's become a sin because he didn't fix it. Now we have to. So the next part of the verse. Okay, so that that's uh, that's pretty much it. The point is, there is a way to fix it when you've done something wrong, and if you don't do that, if you don't fix it, you're making it not just something you did wrong by accident. Now you're making it something wrong on purpose because you on purpose didn't fix it. And that's that makes it so much worse. Okay, let's skip a little bit to the next idea. If there's no questions. Chapter 22, verse 18. Chapter 22, verse 18. It says, The bear al Aaron vel benavel kol b'nei Yisrael speak to Aaron and his sons and all the Jewish people. The martel of heaven say to them, Ish, ish, me bet Yisrael, min hager be Yisrael, whether you're Jewish or whether you're non-Jew living in Israel, uh, who's accepted the seven Noahite laws, asher yakriv karbano l'chol n'israhem, that has brought in this offering uh, to all of the Nidrehem. So Neder, we'll see, it has a specific definition. Let's call it a vow for now. Bechol Nidvotam. And to all of your Nidavot, which are also kind of vows. So let's see what the difference is. So you can bring a, besides all the offerings that you had to bring, there's also such a thing as bringing a, a, an offering that is a neder or a nidava, a vow or voluntary offering. That's how we'll tr translate it for now. When we look at Rashi, Rashi says very shortly, Nidreham hare alai, nidvotam hare zo. Very, very important distinction. Make a nether means it's upon me to bring an animal. It's very general. It doesn't really say which animal. It doesn't have to be a specific animal. It doesn't have to be uh, Bob, you know, with a, with a pretty uh, coat. It can be any of your animals as long as it's uh, one of them, as long as it's kosher, etc. Nidvotam means harezo. I'm bringing this one, Bob. If you give your sheep names, so that's what Rashi says. He quotes it from a Gemara, Megillah eight A. If you must know, the Guru Arya wants to know why. And as the Guru Arya wants to know, not why did Rashi say this because it's an important thing to say, but how does the Torah know that? How does the Gemara know in Megillah eight A that uh, what we said is true? That a neder is hare a lie, and in the dava means hare zu. In other words, a neder is when I when, when you say, I want to give a gift of one of my animals, and a and a in the dava is when you say, I give I'm making a vow that I'm going to bring this animal, this particular animal, that specific one. How do you know? The Gur Arya, that's uh, the, uh, this is the Maharal of Prague. Uh, 
So he starts out by saying that, Gemara, that uh, Rashi's quoting Gomorrah, he says in the Kulin, Beresh Kulin. Could be, by the way, the Gemara is in both places. It happens. Hachiluk Sheesh Bidam, there's a difference. Harezu, Lomet Chayev Ba'achorayot. In other words, when you say, when you say Harezu, when you're making the Dava, and you say, this particular animal is, uh, I'm obligated to bring, and then that animal dies. So you do not have to bring another one. There's no substitutions anymore. You're patur. You're exempt. Why? Because you said, I'm bringing that one. Now you can't bring that one. And you never said you were going to bring another one. As opposed to in the Dava, it says, uh, But when it's a, when it's a, Neder, and you say, I, I make a neder that I bring an and I'm going to bring an animal as a sacrifice, and then ace and the animal you thought you were going to bring, but you never mentioned it out loud. That animal is now no longer available, it died or whatever. Now, what the answer is, it's upon you, so you bring it from somewhere else, any other animal, any other animal that you own that's a kosher animal, doesn't matter which one. And the point is. That there's a difference between the two lashonot. But how do you know that? Says the Guru Arya. How do you know it's not the other way around? How does the Gemara know that a that a neder is hare alai and that a nedava is hare zu? How do you know that? Nedava mash mash osim devar mipnei nedivot lev shabo. So the word nedava comes from the word nidivot. Nidivot are, are, are the uh, parts of your heart. That is, your heart is telling you to do this. Right. Um, So a so a, a neder right. So in the dava, therefore, means it comes from the heart. And when you're saying this particular animal, this animal that I have a name for, this animal that I can point to, this animal that I recognize, that's a lot more of a connection than any one of my animals. If you're being specific about which animal you want to bring, that means you're being you're you're putting a lot of your heart, you're putting your heart and soul into this sacrifice, and that's where the word nidava comes in. Now there are a few things I wanted to point out about this commentary. First of all, it's important to know. There's so much to say about this. First of all, it's important to know that what you say matters, right? Whether it's a neder or a nidava. Either way, if you said it, it's it has to be fulfilled. We have mitzvot about that. You can't just uh, you know, oh nobody heard me, so I'm okay. No, if you made if you made a vow, you need to keep it. That's first of all. Second of all, equally important, you can ask questions about anything. You're allowed. Here's the morale. He's, it sounds like he's asking a question about Rashi, but he's just quoting Rashi. He's really asking a question about the Gemara. How does the Gemara know that? Well, there is an answer, right? There is a logical answer, and it has to do with the word Nidava, comes from the word Nidivo, it has to do with the heart, etc. Beautiful. It has an answer. But can he ask that? Is it okay to ask? How does the Gemara know that? Yes. You can always ask questions like that. There's no such thing as something that's off the table without, you know, not unquestionable, a secret of Judaism or whatever, anything like that. Everything can be asked. Everything can be answered. The only question is, will you find the right person to answer the question? That's a very important point. All right, let's skip forward quite a bit. Next chapter. And this is the chapter of, 
Oh boy, see, we're uh, kind of running out of time. See how fast we can do this. This is a chapter of the holidays, and I wanted to uh, point out a, an interesting idea about this time of the year that we're going through right now, which is a sphere at the Omer. There's a lot in this verse, a lot of important information in this verse, but uh, let's just translate it real quick from Safaria. And from the day on which you bring the sheaf of elevation offering, the day after the Sabbath, you shall count off seven weeks, it must be complete. Now, the day after the Sabbath sounds like the day after Shabbat. So there were groups of people who took the Torah literally, by Tusim, for instance, who counted uh, these seven weeks, these 49 days, after Shabbat of Pesach. So literally, they had to start counting on a Sunday. Now, how do you know that's not what the Torah says? So we actually had an interesting, like uh, almost like three-hour class on this once uh, on Shavuot. It's straight from out of the, uh, from the Gemara, but the Malbim has another answer. Let's take a look at the Malbim. This is a long piece. I don't think we'll have time to go through all of it. Oh boy. Yeah, I was going to shorten it, but I guess I ran out of time for that. Uh, all right. Looks one Let's... of the essays I just wrote for my final. Oh, oh yeah, from uh, the album? <laughs> no, no, just the long paper. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> Shame Shabbat. The word Shabbat does not just mean the seventh day of the week. It is Shabbat Shvi. You see, there's a connection between the two. Rock Hashvita. Hefsek Mimlacha. Shvita means a stopping. It means a stopping of work. That's another thing that the word Shabbat means. So after Shabbat doesn't mean after the seventh day. It could also mean after the work. Vagam Yom Tov Mikre Shabbaton. Even Yom Tov is called Shabbaton. Al Shem Hefsek Malacha because we stop working then. The Kuvar Katafti, he wrote it, he already wrote in Pashat Achre. Shaladat Chazal Shem Shabbaton. Vekain Kol Hashemod Shanusaf Behem Nun. Okay, so he goes into. What, uh, what what it means to have a nun at the end of a word. All right. I'll call upon him Yitzdak Shem Shabbat Gam Al Yom Tov. It's clear that Shabbat isn't just a day of the seventh day of the week, where the day after has to be the first day of the week. It could be that Shabbat also means Yom Tov, and the day after means the day after Yom Tov. Now, that being the case, how can you say, in very short language, which the Torah usually uses, how can you say the day after the first day of Pesach? So you can't say, he's going to, uh, the, the Mabam explains, you can't say after Pesach, because Pesach actually used to mean um, the, the 14th. Why? Because the 14th of Nisan was when you brought the Korban Pesach. So that was Pesach. All right. That's what that was that was what's called Pesach. You can't say Achar Yom Tov. You can't say after Yom Tov because you might think that that should be the last day of the Yom Tov. That's when the Yom that's the day after Yom Tov. Right? The, the day after the eighth day of Pesach in the Kutzla, right? The day after the seventh day of Pesach. Either way. So when do you start counting the Omer? So you have to say it has to be after the first day of Yom Tov. And how do you say the first day of Yom Tov? One of the ways to say it is Shabbat. So that's how the Malbim explains the famous idea that after Shabbat means after the first day of Pesach. Excuse me. Of course, he has a lot of explanation about this. 
I cut out of quite a few quite a few details. I apologize because we only have like 10 minutes left and quite a bit more I wanted to do. Let's see if we can do it. We're going to skip now to chapter 24, verse 11. Ben, okay, so this is after the whole story of uh, of the, uh, the the holidays. There's a very unique story because uh, Vayikra doesn't have too many stories. It has all of a sudden the story of somebody who cursed Hashem. We need to understand the story, and to help us will be the Mora, the Chamalibus. It says Vayetze i Ben Isha Yisraelit the son of a Jewish woman, who Ben Ish Mitri, he was the son of a, an Egyptian man, Israel. he lived amongst the Jewish people, he didn't, uh, a fight broke out between him and another Jew, Dan. So this man, because he was in a fight and maybe he was losing, he cursed Hashem, and therefore he uh, eventually he gets punished. The Jewish people don't know what to do, even though there is a, uh, a, a, a comment already given. The Torah tells us what to do with somebody who is uh, who curses Hashem. Mot Yumat. He gets the death penalty. Okay. Um Leibowitz writes, the son of an Israelite woman whose father, okay, so she quotes the Psukim. The offender in the above passage in our Sidra is described as having gone out among the children of Israel, right? It says, Vayetse. First word, Vayetse, and he went out. Where did he come out from? Uh, sorry. The offender of the passage in our Sidra is described as having gone out among the children of Israel. But it is not clear from where exactly he went out. All our commentators are preoccupied with this difficulty and suggest different solutions. Ibn Ezra explains that the blasphemer went out from his tent. But this still does not offer a solution to the need for this information in the first place. Who cares that he went out of his tent? There's a lot of details we don't know. We don't know what color shoes he was wearing or what his hair looked like, or anything. All we know is he went out. So that's a very strange detail. It might easily have been omitted, and uh, and the passage would have lost none of its significance. Rashi cites three explanations advanced in our Talmudic authorities. Uh, here we cite them in the original form, he, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he left the court of Moshe because there was, there was a fight about the actual land that he's supposed to be a part of. He Remember, he is... He, is, he does not have a Jewish father. So he, our, our, the location of where we lived was based on where our, uh, where our tribe was located. And he didn't have a tribe. So where is he supposed to live? So there's this whole discussion about that. All right, so that's one explanation. Uh, he lost his case, and that's why he, uh, that's why he blasphemed. Um, Rashi also quotes the Tanchuma, that he left means he went out uh, from the world. In other words, he decided to do something terrible uh, and basically killed himself. That's called uh, going out, going out of the world. So let us try to understand first the textual basis for the three explanations. She goes into each and every verse and uh, how it could be that it proves the, uh, the idea says that he was uh, fighting Bamachana. Again, a location is given when it doesn't need to be given. Um, okay. So I just want to skip to the end here for argument. This is what I wanted to read. Blasphemy is a debasement of human dignity. The erasure of the divine image in man. What are you cursing when you curse Hashem? You're not cursing Hashem. We say we, we, we say that you do, but it doesn't really affect him. What, is it, what does he care if you curse him? You have a great, unimaginable power within you. You have spirituality beyond your reckoning. And when you curse Hashem, 
You're really cursing yourself. You're saying, I am not worthy of this. Let us cite the comment of Sefer HaChinuch on the precept prohibiting blasphemy. By such evil utterance, man divests himself of his goodness and all his innate dignity becomes indestructive. He becomes a beast. He abuses the very thing which sets him above the beast, the, the gift of speech. The Torah warns us against this since the beneficent deity desires our well-being and every utterance that undermines it violates his wishes. The context in which the story of the blasphemer occurs lends support to the views of the Sefer Chinuch, which, with, which uh, regarded the sin as constituting a derogation and violation of human dignity and holiness. She gives other sources that prove the same idea, but the point is again this: that when the the worst, what did he do when he was when he was Yitzay? He left his own power, he left his own dignity, he left his own greatness, his holiness that we all share. We're such holy things. If only we would see it for just a moment. Forget about being like Aaron and seeing it everywhere. But us, if we could see it, just a little bit, it would be an amazing thing. So just in case we didn't have enough um, to take home with us, there's one other comment I would like to bring up today. And this is from Rav Moshe Sternbach in Tam Vedat. The famous phrase, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, shever tachat shever, ayin tachat ayin, a, hurt, a break for a break, Eye for an eye, shane tacha chain, tooth for a tooth, kasher yitain mum, but adam kain yinatain bo. Just as you damage another person, so the court damages you. Now, of course, we know this is not taken literally. This is figuratively. This is a uh, uh, if you uh, if you destroyed something of uh, of a particular value that is evaluated, and then you have to pay that value, right? You broke somebody's uh, fingers. Now you broke somebody's fingers and they're, you know, they're, uh, you know, I don't know, retired and they don't need their fingers. They don't uh, do anything very serious with their fingers or whatever. Say so it's just out of one hand or whatever. They can, they can get by. So you would have to pay a fine, but not so much. But let's say you broke the fingers of, you know, it's a curl. Neurosurgeon. Neurosurgeon. Mm -hmm. A neurosurgeon. Neurosurgeon. Thank you. I was going to say it's a Perlman, but okay. Neurosurgeon. Either way, these fingers are precious. They're worth millions of dollars, right? They're uh, the, uh, immeasurable, right? They say like Priceless. on uh, they say like on interviews with like Broadway actors, it's like they have to go to like all these nose throat doctors and they pay a ton of money because they're like, you know what? If I can't sing one day, then <laughs> I lose my job. Right. That's that's a you know. Uh, you, you often hear like a concert was canceled because such and such singer had a, has a cold. It's not, you know, it's not, uh, it's not so simple. You know, you, you lose your voice. That's it. At least for a day, maybe longer. Right. So, so that's what it means. That's what this whole verse means. It's not, uh, it's not the, the, that the court would punish somebody, uh, you know, an eye for an eye, literally. Uh, but anyway, that's not where uh, Rav Moshe uh, Sternbach is going to take us. Look at this very, very interesting perspective. We just had a quote from Sefer Chinuch. Uh, now we're going to have a quote from another famous classic Sefer. Nira bivar bivar kasher yitain mumba adam. So from this idea of uh, causing injury to a person, ki mi asher yitain mum b'chavero l'davar l'davar alav. He's quoting here an idea that someone who speaks Lashon Hara and injures somebody that way, they are also injured in the same way. What does that mean? He quotes in that chapter, Katav, it says, somebody who speaks Lashon Hara about his friend, 
all of his schut, all of his merits, right? A spoke about B after he ate his dessert, right? Uh, A spoke about B. Now B gets all of A's merits also. So be careful who you speak Lashon Hara about. Right? You speak Lashon Hara about a bad person and you shouldn't have spoken. This wasn't for a little elet. It wasn't for any constructive purpose, which uh, you are allowed to sometimes do. Uh, but if you, if you spoke Lashon Hara about an evil person, they just got all of your mitzvot. All of them. You know, like, uh, you know, like uh, uh, immediate transfer. You, you push, the, you push the, the transfer from one bank to another button. And your phone right? and your app, ding! And all of your merits, all of your skuyot, all go to this person. Not retroactively, not all the merits you're going to earn, relax, but all of your mitzvot from the past. You learned daf yomi, you made a siyam, ha ha! Yeah, that mitzvah, forget about that. That just uh, that just went to this uh, other person. So be careful with, about speaking lashon hara. So that's what it says in Chavot Levavot, and he. So Rav Sternbach is saying that this verse hints to that. How? Good question. Mikan Remez. This is a hint to that. Sha'af on shamumav shanatal bechavero. Just like any kind of mum, any kind of damage you, you uh, give your fellow. Inatin bo, you have to pay for it. Kiluhu asham. As if he did it himself. Ubeperik. Dalad, the Kedushan, says in, in the fourth chapter of Kedushan, page 70a, Ita kol haposo b'mono poso, b'mumo poso, somebody who's saying that somebody is uh, is defective is really just pointing out his own defects. That's a, it's a psychological term called, what is it called, refraction or reflection. Uh, anyway, uh, who Rome is... Who Rome is Projection? Huh? Projection? Projection. Okay, that, that'll work. Uh Sefer Amispa Mumim Poso Mumim Elo. He's making himself, he's uh, through these very, very defects, he's making himself uh, very it's very clear that he himself has these defects. Shomer Nafsho Yasim Libo. Guard your soul, protect your heart, and stay far away from this sin. Rav Sternbach doesn't usually give, he sometimes does, but very rarely does he give such very uh, strong language in, in, the, in his conclusion. Think, don't do it. Whatever you do, don't speak Lashon Hara about somebody because you don't know what the punishment is going to be. You don't know how great it's going to be. You don't know how great you are. You don't know how great your punishments are. You don't know how great your merits are. We, there's so much we don't know. And the, uh, this, the, one of the beautiful themes that seems to be running through this class today is that we just, we're just, we just, we're in a haze. You know, we just don't know how great things are. We're, we're not aware of how godly the world is. We don't know how many merits we have. We don't know how easy it is to lose those merits just by doing a stupid thing like speaking about somebody Lashon Hara. Anyway, that's the class for tonight. Uh, sorry we went over time a little bit. And sorry, sorry that we started late. I'm going to stop the live uh, stream to Facebook. If there's any questions, this is the time.